I'm not here to criticize any side. I'm not a politician. I'm not a party member. I don't deal with politics. Politics is a dirty job today, mainly in the Middle East, where the rule is might is right. And for me, might cannot be right. Christ on the cross was not mighty, but he was right. So good evening, everyone. My name is Michael Spath, and I'm the executive director of the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace. We're a voice of conscience for peace, justice, human rights, and intercultural encounter. So Isria, I'm going to ask you to come forward now. And uh, this is Isria Sharon, and she's the executive director of Pilgrims of Ibeline. OK, well, good evening, um, everyone. Really nice to um, have you all here. Thank you for coming out. Um, so yeah, my name is Esria, and I'm the executive director of Chil uh, Pilgrims of Ebeline. And um, so I just wanted to give you a little bit of background about Abuna and Pilgrims of Ibeline. And um, so, so it is quite an honor, honestly, to have you with us. And just in case um, some of you are not familiar with the term Abuna, Abuna is um, Arabic for father. And so we call uh, Father Shakur Abuna. Um, and it, it, I will say it was not easy for him to get here. There is an uh, incredible amount of violence that is happening um, right in his neighborhood. Uh, flights were canceled, had to reschedule. Um, it took, I think, something like two or three days to get here. There was delays. There was issues. So anyway, it's really um, awesome to have you with us. Um, thank you so much. But I'm just going to give you a, a little bit of a background um, to set the stage. So Father Shakur was born in a village called Biram, which is in the north, um, in, in the Galilee in 1939. So um, this is the village of Biram in, in um, a picture taken in 1949. Um, and it was, it was shortly thereafter uh, destroyed um, to the next slide. So this is uh, Biram today. It was destroyed when the um, nation of Israel was established. And um, so the ruins of, of Father Shakur and all the villagers of Biram's homes um, are in ruins um, looking like this uh, today. And um, today, actually, Biram is a national park where picnic, picnic goers can um, have a picnic amongst the ruins of his home and village. Um, and so these early experiences fired young Elias to pursue a path in the church, um, leading him to study theology in Paris and eventually returned to his homeland with a mission to foster peace through spiritual leadership and education. He was ordained in 1965 and was sent to a tiny Arab village in the Galilee, about 20 miles from the border with Lebanon. His bishop sent him there just for one month, and uh, now almost 60 years later, um, he's st still there to this day. Okay, next slide. So here in the map, um, Biram, the, his home village, is up all the way up near Lebanon. And then Ibeline is just to the west of Tiberias and just to the east of Haifa there. Um, when he first arrived in Ibeline, oh, next slide. Um, when he first arrived in Ibeline in 1965, there were no paved roads. There was no electricity. It did have two churches and a mosque. Next slide. And there... This is a more recent picture, not from 1965, but you can see a view with a mosque and two churches. Okay, next slide. So um, when Abuna first arrived, he was not welcomed by the church or the community. Uh, the parish house had disintegrated due to neglect, and it was completely uninhabitable. And so this van, this VW bug, I mean, this VW bug was his uh, bedroom <laughs> for some, some months. Okay, next slide. 
Uh, so early on, um, he, he uh, felt a real um, compassion for the children of Ibeline. And so with the help of several nuns from Nazareth, Abuna opened a kindergarten in 1970 and brought people of the town together across religious lines because they all agreed that they wanted the best for their children. And um, which is, it was unusual in the, in the day. And um, so out of this new building, um, Abuna established the first library also in an Arab village. He started a community center and eventually organized summer camps that attracted thousands of children. Next slide. So um, here's a, a more recent picture. The kindergarten today, ages three through five, serves about or over 200 children. And his goal was to bring together students, Christians, Muslims, Druze, and Jews under one roof where they could learn together. And um, not just academic subjects, but also the value of tolerance and mutual respect. Next slide. Abuna felt a special concern for the children of Ibeline. Half of the population of Ibeline were 14 years or younger. And um, he believed that education was the key to breaking down barriers of hatred and understanding, or misunderstanding. Next slide. Um, and so in the, in the um, early 80s, he turned his attention to, um, to teenagers. Um, the low quality uh, local government school ended at age eighth grade and very few of the students then went on to um, you know, a neighboring village um, high school. Um, it was, I think in a village population of 8,500, only 90 students went on to high school in nearby villages and only five of those 90 were girls. Next slide. Um, so in the early 80s, um, after school, students and teachers um, and other members of the community came together, working together to build a new high school building on the barren, on the barren hillside across a valley from Ibeline. Okay, next slide. So here's the first graduating class in 1984. When they first started in 1981, they had to use a kindergarten um, building before uh, their building was built. And then in the next slide, you can see um, even, this is a more uh, current picture where new floors have been added. And now I think there's something like um, 850 high school students enrolled. And um, in the elementary and junior high, I believe it's over a thousand. And so it's somewhere around two to 2,500 students total from age three months to 18 years old. Next slide. Father Shakur believes that when children of different faiths and backgrounds learn side by side, they not only gain knowledge, but they, they also develop empathy and understanding. These are essential foundations for, peaceful, for a more peaceful future. And the students, um, at this point, it's about 65% Muslim, 35% Christian. Um, they regularly engage with Jewish students in the, in the neighborhood um, or like in the neighboring villages or area um, to help build bridges with each other and break down barriers that might impede friendship. Um, students are very fortunate to have exceptional teachers at Mar Elias um, and state-of-the-art labs and learning tools. And um, as a result, the high school uh, students, there's a national test you take when you're a senior and their test, test grades always um, put them in like the top 10 of, of schools in the nation. And it's the only Arab school that can say anything, you know, anything close to that. Next slide. Um, so what began as a small initiative has blossomed into a comprehensive educational network with students from all over Galilee and beyond, representing a microcosm of the region's rich but often divided cultural mosaic. It's very, very, very unusual in Israel to have a school with such a mix of students from different religions and different, um, even different villages is exceedingly rare. Okay, next slide. Um, this church 
is also on the campus. It's the Church of the Sermon on the Mount. It's the largest Melkite Catholic church in Israel and Palestine. And um, next slide, you can see these are the uh, steps leading up to the entrance of the church with uh, the Beatitudes have been carved into the stone steps. Next slide. Um, Archbishop Shakur's work with Mar Elias is a reflection of his deep, deep commitment to peace, justice, and education. For decades, he's been bringing children and youth together to instill in them the value of living, or of loving thy neighbor and building peace together. And now, it's a great honor to have Michael Spath uh, have a conversation with you, Father Shakur, and thank you so much for making the effort to join us today. Abuna said I could ask him anything I wanted, but he had the right to answer with anything he wanted. So uh, uh, that's, that's the ground rules for, for tonight. So Abuna, uh, this is your fifth time to Indiana Center, your fifth time in Fort Wayne, and uh, welcome back, and welcome back to Plymouth Church. And I'm going to give you the microphone after I ask the questions, okay? Um, we gather here tonight on day 368 at the beginning of the second year of Israel's genocide in Gaza and the West Bank. Seventy-six years uh, into their ethnic cleansing project in Palestine. And now uh, as they're bombing Lebanon, assassinations in Iran, Syria, um, things are getting more and more bleak. You're not in the West Bank like most of our guests. So you're a citizen of Israel. Your school's in Israel. Your students are Palestinians, but also Israeli citizens. Talk to us about Israel's genocidal project and just give us your take on what's been going on the last year. It is such a pleasure to share with you some of our ex daily experience of our life. You do not represent for us normal friends. You are a surprise to us. You're Americans, is that right? But from America, we know their, your foreign policy. We know that you are providing the war with bombs, with explosives, with machine guns. And for us, you are the beautiful face of America. God bless this America with this beautiful face. So I thank you for being close. I'm not here to criticize any side. I'm not a politician. I'm not a party member. I don't deal with politics. Politics is a dirty job today, mainly in the Middle East, where the rule is might is right. And for me, might cannot be right. Christ on the cross was not mighty, but he was right. So I'm very, very pleased to be with you and to have that exchange. Please know that there is no just war. There are just wars. And no one is victor in any war. You have two losers. Even in the war with Gaza, there are two losers, two big losers, two immensely big losers, and we pity all of them, although our heart aches a lot when we turn our TV every day and we are mesmerized as if we don't believe what we see. Every day, hundreds and more people are murdered, are killed in their homes that were destroyed on them and reduced to rubble. And many, many of them remain under the rubbles. We feel that these are children of God, killed for what? For a claim. For a claim that's wrong. The claim on the land. The Jews say, the land, Palestine, is ours, and only ours. We, the Palestinians, say, no, the land, is ours, is also ours. And I think that both are wrong. 
in assessing that the land belongs to them. There is a book on the table called We Belong to the Land. Unless we learn to belong to the land, unless we remember that we are sojourners on the land, and we are traveling every day, willing or unwilling, and we will leave the land. And Isaiah says in his first five chapters, woe to those who join one home to another, who confiscate one piece of land after the other, till they believe that the land belongs to them. No, the land is God's, and they will be deported from the land, naked, as when they were born from their mothers. We don't want anybody to be deported, but we want everybody to share, and that's our main dream. I stop here. It seems your uh, Ibelin is in the north, and Biram's even further in the north. Uh, you're, as Esria said, you're close to the Lebanon border. It seems that Israel's hell bent on making this a regional conflict. I mean, they're going after all of their uh, uh, enemies in the region: they, Hamas, Hezbollah, uh, Iran, and so many others. Uh, all the while, cozying up to Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and and others. Uh, in the Middle East as well. And they're trying to draw the United States and countries in Europe, the UK and Germany, into a regional war, kind of a, their own final solution. Talk to, us about, um, talk to us about the expansion of this war. Well, I really hope that Israel will stop one day looking for hidden enemies and they would start looking for hidden friends. And they will find many, many, many friends. The Jews in the Arab countries were masters, were very happy. They still speak Arabic between themselves in Israel. Moroccan Jews, other Jews, Syrian Jews, Iraqi Jews. They were all feeling at home. And they are called now in Israel the Iraqi Jews, the Tunisian Jews. So I, I really pray and hope that Israel will start building friendship with the neighboring Arab countries, starting with the Palestinians, who remember that they were in Palestine and that Palestine was their country only 74 years ago. I was not born in Israel. Israel was born in me when I was a young boy. There is a need to consider the right of the other without denying your own right. <coughs> in the last year, I mean, even before then, right? But particularly in the last year, there's been an intentional targeting of schools, hospitals, churches and mosques, and other cultural institutions, uh, wells and aquifers, arch orchards and fields. Uh, the statistics are staggering, 42,000 killed. Uh, but according to the independent uh, medical journal, uh, uh, The Lancet, they say over 180,000 uh, have been killed in the last year in Gaza, including 22,000 children, 20,000 children missing, 20,000 children orphaned, and most of the 2.1 million people of Gaza displaced with all kinds of ongoing medical and humanitarian needs. So the, the statistics are staggering, but each one of these was a unique human being, a unique and special child of God, uh, who had a name and a family, and as you might say, each one was born a baby. Every morning, I have the honor and the privilege to address all our children in the elementary and in the high school. And I tell them, I am the archbishop. That means I'm the head of the church in Israel. But I was not born Christian. 
thank God, among the students are 65% Muslims. I was not born a Christian. What about you? Were you born Christian, Muslim, Druze, or Jews? I was born a baby. On the image and the lines of God, with dignity, with, with dreaming of freedom, of happy life. And that's the common denominator among all us. We had the visit of the president of the state of Israel in the village. And I was supposed to welcome him. I told him that we live in the darkness now in the Middle East, and very special in Israel. And I hope you as president, <coughs> sorry, you carry a candle, a lit candle. This little light needs to be bigger. You need to multiply the lights in Israel. Otherwise, if we fall in the darkness, woe to us, we shall disappear. And we don't want that. I can comment on what's going on in Gaza, but I refuse. I would sound to be one-sided. But it's absolutely clear. No authority in the world has the right to decide to eliminate another authority. And it's a policy of eliminating Gaza, eliminating the people of Gaza. Who are the people of Gaza? They are there only for 74 years. These are the old Palestinians who were deported. When they look from their refugee camp, they see their villages in the horizon. These are our villages. These are our fields. And it's a continuation of suffering, of deprivation. These are the Palestinian refugees who have the right to live, who have the right to state, who have the right to freedom. <coughs> and in remembering Palestine, they are considered to be terrorists. But you know, many Jewish soldiers were killed in this war, are killed daily. They are considered by the Palestinians to be Jewish terrorists. And all the men and women, the children, the boys, the girls, that were massacred in Gaza, are considered by Israel officially as a present or a future terrorist. There is no terrorist nation, brothers. In America, you have more terror actions than in normal days in Palestine. We never excluded Americans are a terrorist nation. Far from that. We say America, poor Americans, they have so many terror manifestations. <clears throat> but when a Palestinian gets despairing, have no hope, looks for happiness and he does not find it, and he commits suicide, or he kills others. He is not labeled terrorist. It's all the Palestinians who are a Palestinian terrorist. We are all terrorists. I am a terrorist. Although I never believed in any kind of violence, verbal or physical. But the right of the might labels the others as being terrorists as the Jews were labeled dirty Jew under the Nazi regime. Some, some of the heroes of this last year have been healthcare workers and journalists. There are others, of course, but healthcare workers and journalists, especially in Gaza, according to the United Nations Human Rights Office, more than 900 healthcare workers and more than 130 journalists have been targeted and killed by Israel in Gaza. 
talk a little bit about uh, these heroes and others in your view. What do you want me to see? Whatever I see would sound one-sided. That's why I prefer not to relate to that. But all these journalists are the heroes of telling the world what is going on on a daily basis. And they were targeted. Some of them were Christian journalists. Some were international journalists. Some were Muslims. As soon as they are journalists, they take the news over to the whole world. And they are considered as part of the terror machine. That's a tragedy. One of the things, the reason I wanted you to talk about t uh, journalists is because in this country, uh, about the war, this, this genocidal war, but also in our country about many other things, there's a war on truth, a war on truth. And so um, these, these journalists who are telling the story from within Gaza, some were, weren't, weren't, I mean, they're unofficial sometimes, they just have a blog posting or they post a picture on TikTok, they're real heroes be because they're fighting against this war on truth. What is the truth? Who knows the truth? Is the truth that 75 years ago, Israel did not exist. There was no Israel. We celebrated, they celebrated the Independence Day few weeks ago. Israel did not exist 75 years ago. Palestinians, they were not refugees. No Palestinian was a refugee. They did not drop down from heaven as born refugees. They were made refugees because the Zionist movement decided that a land without a nation belongs to a nation without a land. When the Herzl was told, but you mean Palestine? But Palestine is überbevölkert. Palestine is overpopulated. He answered a very famous answer. We have to be kurzsichtig, short-sighted. Do as if there is nothing. And the Palestinians became the victims. So we are the victim of another victim in another country. And the tragedy is that we are both right, but we exaggerate in our right so much that we become wrong in our doings. You mentioned, or Asriya mentioned, that every morning when you're in town, you uh, stand and welcome the kids to school and speak to them in the quad before they begin their day. I, talk to us about how the, how the students are, are coping how are they bearing up under the trauma um, of the genocide? 2,500 kids at Mar Elias schools. And are there, are there any special programs at the school to help them cope and to channel, channel their suffering and to channel their rage? Our students come from almost 25 towns and villages from over, all over Galilee. We used to have children coming from the Negev, far away, others from the far north. And in the first three months of every year, we know that they come with their prejudices from their village. Muslims have so many prejudices against Christians. Christians have so many prejudices against Muslims. And we need to convince them that they have to look at the unknown one as a potential friend not as a potential enemy. And that works. Our main effort is to create unity within diversity. That means having Muslims there. You would say, how many Muslims did you convert to Christianity? No one. Because our aim is not to convert them to Christianity. To what kind of Christianity should I convert them? to reformed, re-reformed, or not yet reformed Christianity. <laughs> we need to work about unity among ourselves. 
before converting others. We want the Muslim to be right Muslims and the Christian to be faithful to their faith. And we want them to accept each other. We have so much in common, much more than what divides us. We do not welcome the Muslims as being our guests in our Christian school. We welcome them as our partners, whether you like it or not. Our partners, full partners. And I must confess that the Muslims show much more gratitude, often more than the Christians. There are Muslims, a Muslim person only, who donated all the electricity lamps of the school from his own business as a gift. We have many, many contact with the Muslims. The mayor of Abilene is a Muslim, surely. He organized a day to honor what I have done to the village. I resisted in the beginning, but he insisted, and he invited 850 persons in a big hall. It was a manifestation of unity of the village, of unity beyond the differences. And we have to discover that we are born babies. And this is what we help our children to do. And I love my children in the school. I love the Muslims dearly, as much as I love the Christians, sometimes more. <laughs> and I loved the Jewish children who were with us in the year 2000. And I wish it was possible to keep having more Jews. My dream is the day when the schools will welcome everybody, Jewish, Christian, Muslim, Druze, and make them feel at home and treat them as equals, as having the same dignity. This is my dream. I hope it will come true in the future, the f near future. As I said, this ethnic cleansing project is 76 years old now, but I, I wanna, Abuna, I wanna take you back to when you were a boy now, uh, you tell the story in Blood Brothers related to you by your brothers. Uh, the Israeli military expelled your family and all the villagers from your home village in Bihram uh, in 1948. I, I, I mentioned to you on one of my first visits to Ibeline, you took me to Bihram and we walked through the, the fields and the ruins. Well, a after years of court battles, you were given permission to return, but as they were all returning on Christmas Day, 1951, as they were all walking home from the neighboring village that uh, had taken you in, as they reached the top of the hill and saw their village at the break of day, well, you finish the story. Tell us about that morning. Well, I dream of the day when I can go back and rebuild my father's home in the village of Baram. This is the only dream I have for the future but I know that it will not come soon. We are living in a very peaceful village. My father gathered us one day, 1948, saying there are rumors going around that Jewish soldiers might come to our village. We are used to have Jews, Jewish human beings coming to buy and to sell things, but not coming as soldiers. Father said, don't be scared of them. They have machine guns, but they do not kill. Who believes that? He said they are survivors of a certain satanic plan somewhere in Europe, aiming at killing all the Jews. And thank God the Jews survived and the plan was destroyed. And some of these survivors will be coming to our village. Father said, we will come them. We'll slaughter the Paschal lamb to celebrate the resurrection with their coming. And I will ask you and mother 
to sleep on the roof of the house while they will sleep in our beds. He said they are our blood brothers. That's why my book is called Blood Brothers. We said, how comes, Father, that they are our blood brothers? He said, yes. They are our blood brothers. They claim to be the children of Abraham, and Abraham is our father also. In fact, three days later, Jews started streaming to the village. They did not kill anybody. They did not hurt anybody. They did not hurt anybody. They accepted our food, and they slept in our beds while we slept on the roof. By the way, in Galilee, it's so pleasant to sleep on the roof. If you don't sleep, you can count the stars. 100, 1,000, from evening to, to morning, tens of thousands of stars. Our skies are full of stars, not like your stars. You never see the stars. <laughs> you have too many lights on the streets. You never raise your head to see the stars. But in Galilee, the sky is full of stars. Don't go and sleep on the roof here. You would be frozen. But there is very pleasant. After two weeks, the officer of the army ordered all heads of family to come and see him next morning. His name was Manu. They came in the morning, and he gave them the order. I have to give you the, the military orders. You go take wife and children, and you leave the village for two weeks. And here is a written military promise. In two weeks, you can come back. What can simple peasant do otherwise than obey the orders of armed soldier? We left the, can the village. I remember I left with a small blanket on my shoulder. It's like all I could carry as a boy of eight years old. Went to hillside for us children to live under our trees. Was like paradise. We spent the whole day climbing the trees up and down, eating figs, eating uh, almonds, eating all the fruits, grapes. After one week, it became boring. We wanted to go back home. We pressured our fathers. You go and see the army. You have their promise that you come in two weeks. The two weeks are elapsed. So all the heads of families gathered, and they went down to see the army. It's a walk of 35 to 40 minutes. And we were waiting their return to go back home. We waited, waited, and waited, and no news. They never came back. We did not know what happened to them. Were they killed? Were they imprisoned? Did they escape to Nice, to, next, to, uh, to close by Lebanon? We had no clue. We left from under the trees to a nearby village where some of the inhabitants were still remaining there, and others escaped to Lebanon. We found a room there, about 35 square meters. We lived in that room whose owner escaped to Lebanon. And I remember every evening, mother would gather us children, f five brothers and sisters, and she would pray every evening for the government so that God changes their heart of stone and replace them with heart of flesh. She would pray for her bishop. She would pray for her for the return of her husband. This is an unfailing memory, her lost husband. Three months later, when we were praying, I remember that as if it's now. Someone pushed the door of the house. We could not lock the door. There was no locker. We could close it. Someone pushed the door. It was father. We thought it was his ghost. We rushed to him, grabbed him. Father, you don't go. You, we need you. You stay here. And he kept telling us, quiet down. 
I'm not coming to go. I'm coming to stay. And he told us the tragic story that happened to them when they left us down to go to the army. They said they welcomed us with big trucks. They loaded us like cattle into big trucks. And they drove us to the nearby, the far away city of Nablus in the West Bank. That was very far away for us. Communication were not as easy as today. And there in front of the Jordan River, they told them, this land does no, belong, no more belong to you. You have to go away and never come back. If you try to trespass the border, you will be killed before you do that. And they crossed the, border, the Jordan River. Don't ask me what kind of boat did they use. <laughs> this is the only river I know in the world when you can cross it without any problem. They crossed the Jordan River and went to the famous place Pella, where the Christians in the year 68 fled from Jerusalem and took residence in Pella. And they could not stay there. It's a desert with no livelihood, with no possibility to live. They stayed a while in Pella, and they continued their way to the hospitable city of Damascus in Syria. And that's what the refugee's father said. Went to Pella, it was impossible to survive. Went up to Amman. The village of Amman was a miserable village, dirty. Uh, no place to stay, no water, no facility. Now Amman is one of the most active capitals of the Middle East. It's no more a dirty village. But they did not stay there. They went northwise toward the city, the welcoming city of Damascus. There they saw the dimension of the tragedy they fell in. They saw hundreds of thousands of other Palestinians who are seeking shelter. They could not stay there. They went westwise toward the city of Beirut, and they became the Palestinian Arab refugees in Lebanon. Soon, a few years later, the journalists would drop Palestinians and remain the Arab refugees in Lebanon. We never thought that a president of the state of uh, American state will come in order to please the diplomatic persons in Israel and to declare those who call them Palestinians, they have to know they have no right to return. They will never return back. You find solution wherever you can. Thank you, Mr. President. George W. Bush. This man climbed such a high tree. And when he was up, he could not come down. He forgot that he's just a bush. <laughs> God bless him. I had, I had to welcome him just before he retired when he came to visit the holy sites. And I welcomed him on the Mount of Beatitudes. That's a long story. So Father said, I know the way back home I convinced some of our friends, and we went secretly back home. And here I am with you. Father was a staunch believer in nonviolence. He educated us to reject any kind of verbal or physical violence. And he was a very, very strong believer in God and in Jesus Christ. He and mother used to teach me that our compatriot, meaning Jesus Christ, did not come to teach us fancy things. He did not come to, to proclaim us blessed because we believe in the Beatitudes. He came to invite us to do something, to work, to get engaged in order to build peace and justice. By the way, peace up till now 
does not need contemplators. Peace needs contractors who get their hands dirty in order to bring peace to the world. Peace is a very difficult thing to realize. We can sit hours contemplating peace. We are just contemplating fancy things. <coughs> Father, convince the remaining fathers of families to raise funds from their little money and to file a case against the state of Israel. And they went to the High Court of Justice of Israel. They did not have Supreme Court of Justice. And that High Court of Justice in Jerusalem ruled after two weeks of discussion that these people have the promise of the army. They are peaceful people. They have the right to return. But the army opposed. A year later, they went again. The same resolution was in their favor. These are peaceful people. They have the right to return. The army still opposed. Three years later, after going to the same court, having the same resolution, they decided to leave the village where there are refugees and go back home. And we started a march of five kilometers, less than that. When we were about to enter the homes, a few hundred meters away from that, we saw airplanes coming we don't know where from, and they started raining. Bombs, dynamite, explosive on our chairs, on our home. By the, by the way, the village was entirely Christian village. We stood there and cried like babies. We cried so much that the place has been named the Barham people wailing wall. When I go to Barham and reach that place, I have tears in my eyes. Why should we pay the bill for what we have not done? Father was a staunch believer in God. He wanted that one of his children becomes a priest. And he sent my elder brother the father of Gab, who is here. Where are you, Gabby? Gabby's over here. Yeah. To seminary. He was three months in seminary, and Abud he escaped. Abud's nephew from South Bend. Sorry, please. The man remained three months in the seminary and escaped. He did not want to hear about that. <laughs> Good for him. He made a beautiful family. One of their fruits is Gabby and his brothers who every day call their father in Haifa. He's still alive. He's 99 years old. He will be 100 in one year. And we are praying that he remains alive to celebrate his 100th anniversary. He has a beautiful memory, a very smart memory. The second brother refused to go to seminary. He said, if you send me to seminary, I will commit suicide. <laughs> yeah, the many, third brother, many, many of us feel that way. I just yeah, the, fir the third brother escaped from home, crossed the Jordan River, and took refugees with one of the Bedouin tribes in Jordan. Father was looking for him. He found where his whereabouts. He went there and met with the sheikh, with the not uh, dignitaries. They said, we'll give you back your child. Provided he would accept, otherwise he is under our refuge. The child was brought in, and he said to father, I will not go with you, father. If I go with you, you will send me to seminary, and I don't want to go. Father promised him he will not send him. So he took his child back home. Who remained? The youngest one, me. And father delivered me to the bishop who took me with his car from the village where we became refugees to Haifa. And he had to place me in the orphanage because he had no seminary. And I stayed there till I finished the eighth grade elementary school. Then I was sent to Nazareth for the high school. After we finished, 
the bishop had to send me. We are two only. Had to send us to seminary to study theology, philosophy, and do all the business that priests study. He could send us to Jerusalem, where we had our major seminary. But it was divided. It was no more in Israel, but in Jordan. We needed an, ex an exit visa from Israel to Jordan and an entrance visa from Jordan to Jerusalem. The bishop applied for a visa on both sides. And the answer was identical. The Jews said, we will never allow our Arabs, as you say, our dog and our cat, to go to the Arab country and come back contaminated with Arab ideology. And the Jordanians answered, we will never allow already contaminated Arabs with Zionism to come and study in our country. We are not contaminated with any Arab ideology or Jewish ideology. So the bishop had to send me either to Rome or to Paris. And I had a very clever bishop, very inspired. He did not decide to send me to Rome. Thank God. I hate studying in Rome. He decided to send me to Paris, where I spent six years in the Sorbonne and the Institut Catholique, where they, they taught us anything, everything that has to do with priesthood, Bible, church history, Mariology, Angelology, Christology, everything, everything. When I came back to, to Nazareth after six years, I confess I have forgotten everything except one thing. God does not kill. God is love. All the rest is commentary. That's why I signed my book. Thousands of times, God does not kill. I was ordained priest in 1965, as Michael mentioned and Estria. My bishop sent me for one week to a village, one month, called Ebelin. I never heard of that. He said, it's close to Haifa. Take your car you brought with you from Germany and go to Ebelin for one month. And after that, we'll decide your final assignment. I drove to Ebelin. I was lost. It took me much time to reach. When I reached there, I wanted, I discovered the village was very, very primitive. Roads were dirt roads, no electricity, no telephone. And I'm coming back from Paris, goodness, where I had all these facilities. I did not mind. I minded to find where the church is. I discovered where the church is. Few children were playing there, asked, asked them, do you know where is the, the residence of the priest? They laughed sarcastically, saying, the priest has no residence here. I said, these are children. I waited till few older men come. And minutes later, three old men were passing by. I coasted them and said, do you know where is the, president, the uh, residence of the priest? They said, we are sorry to tell you there is no residence for the priest in this village. But what, what did my successor do? They said, he left long ago, many years ago. He used to come on Sunday morning, 15 minutes before the Mass. He would celebrate the Eucharist, and he would disappear. We did not know where he was. I had to decide. Is that where the bishop sends me? Where I have no place to stay? I'm not Christ, who did not have any stone to lay his head. I needed some bed. I was very confused. Do I want, do I, do I have to continue, or I abandon this priesthood, go get married, have children, have family, and live simply and happily? Or I will stay. When my anger subsided, I decided to stay. I started sleeping in my Volkswagen bag. It appears that the bishop forgot me there, and I forgot myself. I lived six months in the Volkswagen bag. It was very, very nice, very comfortable for me. You know why? Because then I was not half what I'm now. <laughs> I could fit in very well. 
Today I would not accept to sleep one day in front of my mind. And the story continued there in that village. I became in love with the village. And I did not want to leave it. In, nine, in 1990, I was in Beirut in an unexpected way. I was accompanying 800 journalists from Marseille all around the Mediterranean to reach Jerusalem Avenue. When we landed in Beirut, I went to see the patron. Our bishop became the patron. He told me, I intend to take you away from Galilee. I said, no way. I was born in Galilee. I want to die in Galilee. He said, why are you attached to Galilee? Is God from Galilee? He said, yes, he is from Galilee. <laughs> he laughed as you laughed. He said, you are right. And I'm still there. Let's talk a little bit about the state of the schools. Um, Mar Elias and other Christian schools in Israel have been targeted by the Israeli Ministry of Education, slashing funding that government Jewish schools receive. How have you persevered? You, you, your, I mean, you've told the story many times, but, and, and your faculty and staff are so committed, so dedicated, they have uh, gone often for months without being paid. So tell us about the state of Marlia School and also just say a word about your faculty and staff. I was convinced that our survival and our future depends on the quality of education we give to our young generation. Without excellent education, We'll have no future, and we would not survive. My main goal was to educate the young generation. I started by opening a public library with my own Arabic books. And every time I went to Jerusalem, I bought as many books as I could and add to the library. <clears throat> the library became so big that the children in the school used to come to the library after school to consult books, reference. Then I said, why don't I take care of the young people? I decided to organize summer camps for the children. We started with 200 children from the village of Belin. But we expanded so much that the last summer camp we organized had 5,000 children from all the villages in Ibelin, Christian, Muslim, those, and others. Meanwhile, the feeling became even more decided what we need is a good school in Ibelin. And the parish board of directors encouraged me so much to build a school. So I tried to build, I decided to build a school. So many were against me. The municipality was against me. The bishop was against me. The government was against me. Who are you to build a school? After all, you are a refugee from Baram. You have no land, you have no money. How can you build a school? They did not know that the one I rely on is the only one who can make miracles. I relied on God. And here is a person, Nawar, was a young teacher. She used to tell me, don't worry, Abuna. You have headache now because of the opposition. But when things will run, all that will be forgotten. And she was damn right. We had a piece of land on a mountain called the Mount of the Ogre. I climbed that mountain to visit that land. It was so sleepy, speedy. It was impossible to do anything there. I decided I will change the name of the mountain. And from that day, the name of the mount became 
an amount of light. And there we started to build the school after asking for a building permit. And the answer was denial. I said, they deny us to build the school. We need a school. I will build the school. No matter what happened. Okay, surah, surah. And we leveled the ground. We started building. Three months later, the police arrived. Show me your building permit. I said, I don't have building permit. He said, how can you build without building permit? I said, since you refused to give me a building permit, I don't build with building permit. I build with sand, cement, steel, stones, and that. He was very angry. He said, you don't do like that in a civilized country. I said, if I build a school without a permit, it's in order to help you become a little bit more civilized. He was utterly angry. He could have killed me. But he said, stop arguing. You are someone to court. And this building you have, you're starting, will be destroyed. Okay, sir. He turned around and went away. We resumed the work. Nine months later, the building was standing there, strong and high. I rang a bell, and 82 children came to school. 82. Let me jump 20 years ahead. I was facing every morning over 4,000 students. Amazing. <clears throat> they came from the far away in Egypt and from the far north of the country. It took like fire. This is the best school. And it's still now there. Today we are facing a real problem. We face that all the time. And once I was the ecumenical pastor at Gross Point Memorial Church. And with the Reverend Bruce Rigdon, who said, many people come to visit you. They want to contribute, but they want to be uh, refunded. Tax, tax deductible. Why don't we form a committee, tax deductible committee, and they will have that charge to tell the story of the school and to raise funds for, to help you. And that's how we did it. I think now we have 13 chapters in 13 uh, districts in the United States. And from these people, maybe you are among them, we cannot be grateful enough. They have been always supporters. We did not need long, uh, big amounts from them. We needed just to finance the development projects in the school. But since two years, the program of the educational uh, ministry is to close all the Christian schools. They don't want any Christian school anymore. But we resist. We used to receive from the ministry 75% of what they give to Jewish schools. We were happy with that. We tried to raise funds from the local people, the parents. And with the help of Pilgrims of Berlin, we were able to balance the budget. But since the war in Gaza, we are reduced from 75% to maximum 40% of what the Jewish schools receive. And we are struggling to survive. Pilgrims really are doing their utmost to help us, but what can they do? We need a miracle. We need you to, if you can, contact your congressmen or your senators so that they pressure the Israeli embassy, who would pressure the Israeli government to consider the Christian schools as they consider all other schools. Because if we close our schools, the church, the Christians 
will disappear from the country. By all means, the immigration abroad is becoming very intense. Hundreds of young couples prefer to leave the country and go away. <clears throat> it's only the schools who keep us in touch with our people. And I'm very grateful for anyone who has helped Pilgrim Babylon and would help, help Pilgrim Babylon to help us financially. In the basement, uh, um, Esria showed the chapel, the Sermon on the Mount. In the, in the basement, um, there's a mural painted on uh, one full wall. Many of the people who travel with me have seen this, uh, and I'm, I'm picturing it right now. Your, your parents are pictured on it, as well as many others. And Abuna, at the very center, uh, there's, a, there's pictured a Christian Peacemaker Team member, uh, Mahatma Gandhi, Martin Luther King Jr., Rachel Corey, and there's also uh, 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 Asal Asle, a 17-year-old Maralaya student who was shot uh, by an Israeli soldier uh, 24 years ago on October 2nd. He was 17 years old as he was participating in a uh, demonstration uh, for peace. And they're standing, uh, holding hands in a circle uh, uh, around a tall, brightly lit candle. Why did you place that picture? Talk talks about what you were thinking when you placed that picture in the very center of this mural. Because people like to commemorate their heroes, and these are our heroes. These are the persons we need to follow. And Asil Asli was a young man who was the chairman of a group of students called Seeds for Peace. That's right. We send them often to Washington to meet with senators, to meet with congressmen, and to speak about the need for peace. This man finished his study in the school one day and went back to his village, which is about 20 kilometers farther away. And he was waiting under the olive tree watching people protesting against the confiscation of their land. And the soldiers, we know the soldier himself, rushed on him with the back of their machine gun. They beat him and they shot him from zero distance. When his mother came after he was killed, or during his funeral, I was the only Christian among almost 30,000 people walking the man to the cemetery. I was the only one who gave a sermon on that day. When his mother came later on, after 40 days, to meet with us, she said, I have only one wish. My Asil is dead, he is buried. My only wish is to join him. I have no other ambition in life. Mothers are always mothers. They're crazy. They are full of love, full of affection. Their children are worth everything, whether they are Jewish or Palestinian, whether they are American or Arabs. A mother is a mother, a giver of life. Such a noble feeling she had. She wanted only to join her child, her son. Yeah. A number of years ago, I think it was before COVID, uh, we at Indiana Center for Middle East Peace uh, interviewed, and, and, no, actually we, we hosted on Zoom um, a number of actors. There, there's, if you want to look this up, it's called Donkey Saddle Projects. Donkey Saddle one word projects, and there's a, there's a kind of a reader's theater called There is a Field, and it's a story of Asil Asle. And we interviewed the, the, the creator of the reader's theater who used to be head of Seeds of Peace, as well as some of the actors or some of the readers as part of the reader's theater. So Donkey Saddle Projects, there is a field, and it's the story of Asil Asle. And it, 
as part of the Reader's Theater, they uh, uh, have um, commentary from, I think, the mother and a sister and the seal himself as he goes to the demonstration and, and others. I just have a couple of other questions, Abuna, for you, okay? I want to tell the story yeah, please. of the president of the city of Israel coming to visit me when I was acting archbishop in Haifa. I invited 125 young Christian intellectuals to welcome the president with me. I stood in his presence and said, I'm very honored to welcome you, Mr. President, in my quality of refugee from Baram. I dare remind you that the Baram village was destroyed by the Israeli army, but the Baram people are still waiting to return back home. He interrupted me. He said, but Your Excellency, when you left home, you were a young boy. He said, I did not leave. I was expelled. He said, when you were expelled, you were a young boy. And that's long ago, many years ago. You still remember that Baram is your birthplace. When are you going to forget that Baram is your birthplace? Then I interrupted him. I said, Shimon, Shimon Peres. When you left Palestine, expelled by a Roman emperor, it was 2,000 years ago. We witnessed that, and we stayed waiting for you to come back. And you come back, reduce our life to misery. Tell me, when are you going to forget that Palestine is also your homeland? He answered one word, touche. That's not the answer that I expected. Two, two final questions. Um, on that mural, and Asriya talked about it, uh, the, it could be one of your many mottos, but on that mural, uh, it's written, together we are stronger than the storm. Tell us about the resilience of the Palestinian people and your commitment to this together. You no, know, we can be very... Not intelligent, but we play the intelligent. We are forbidden to speak about Palestine in the school by the Ministry of Education. Thank I need to inform the, the students who ask, why don't you teach us the story of Palestine? I tell them, you know, the Ministry of Education forbids us to speak about Palestine. We'd love to do that, but we are forbidden. You know why? because they don't want us to speak about Palestine. That's the reason why we don't teach you about Palestine. You should see after, one day after, every boy had a book about Palestine as a reaction. We have a, a memory at least as good as that of the Jewish people, if not much better, because it's a memory of 70 years ago. Some people left their home with the key of the house in their hand. Big keys. The, the daughter of Gab, then what was to be married two years ago, Gabby? She decided not to get wed here in America, but to take the family and go back to our village and to get married in the church in the center of the village that is destroyed. And we're all the extended family and friends. We celebrate her wedding in our church. It was a prophetical act. I was extremely moved. So we want to come back. If not we, our children, our nephews, our grandnephews. We want our village back. We're... Uh Wrapping up here, oh, it's time. you uh, in your in your life you have uh, hobnobbed. You've met with popes, dignitaries, political and religious leaders from around the world. You've met with the Dalai Lama and so many others. Uh, and if you don't mind me just being personal now with you, Abuna, your 
in your 86th year, what, what do you hope your legacy will be? Oh, my legacy is what we teach our children. Do not lose hope. When I see the children in the playground or in the classrooms, I ask them one thing. Give me a smile of hope. Do not despair. Find hope beyond despair. And I wrote a small booklet entitled beyond, Hope Beyond Despair. That's I want them to have. That's I want you to have also. A hope, a smile in your life. There are so many beautiful things in our life. Even as refugees, we have so many beautiful things. We need to concentrate on those things and to solve the other points, but not to concentrate on the problem and to get lost with the problem. We're going to ask Esri to come up for just a minute and uh, close for us. But let's say thank you to Abuna for being I hope you are not applauding me, but you are applauding this corner of your conscience that was awake to keep working for peace and justice and to keep the hope alive. Thank you for applauding. Yeah, oh, there it is. Okay, well thank you all for coming and thank you so much, Abuna. Um, beautiful as always. And um, so as you heard, um, Mar Elias is uh, in a dire situation at the moment with a massive, massive cut in funding. And um, we really do appreciate um, any support that you can offer. So Pilgrims of Ibeline is the nonprofit in the United States that um, supports through friends and funds. So in addition to donations, which um, we gratefully accept and we appreciate, and on the, each of the tables we've left um, some envelopes and some pledge cards with our address, um, ways to to uh, use your credit card with that um, scan, uh, QR code, or you could text to donate um, to that number, 50155, but you have to text Elias. And um, you could Venmo, you could PayPal, all sorts of ways to donate. But also, um, honestly, your prayers are also um, so needed and appreciated. So um, please keep uh, not just uh, Abuna and Mar Elias, but just, you know, the whole region. It's going to make me cry because the situation really needs um, our care. And um, you can also sign up for our newsletter. We have um, some actual um, paper and pens back there. You can put your name and email address um, on the, the back uh, table. Um, if you'd like to receive our newsletter, it's once a month. I do not... Um, try to spam people, and um, usually it's just updates of what I hear about the school, and um, often uh, Abuna will include a letter in that. So you can also go to that um, UR co URL code if you'd like as well, or you could just sign up and I'll add you to the newsletter. Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you for your interest. And Abuna has one more comment. Go ahead. I want to tell you a story while we were building the last building of the school, I received a letter from the United States from a certain lady saying, I read your books. I identify with what you are doing. I decided to send you all my savings from last month. And in the envelope, there was a check for $10. Bless this lady. She's dead now. I never saw her. She sent us $10, all her savings. This was worth millions in my eyes. Her name figures on top of one of the classrooms. Lady Sue gave us all her savings, $10. So it's our gratitude for anybody who contributes to build the elite so that they can help us. Thank you.